That's Jethro Tull, and it's called Song for Jeffrey, as chosen by Will Sargent, who's here to talk about his book, Bunny Man, a memoir. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty good, yeah. It's nice. Nice weather we're having. <laughs> and uh, Jethro Tull, Ian Anderson in particular, uh, feature in a sort of Top of the Pops memory in the book, part of an early 70s episode of Top of the Pops. Ian Anderson in particular caught your eye. They were a load of hairies, weren't they? They were more akin to Captain Beefheart than anything else, I think, at the beginning. And I know they were mates with Beefheart because I'm sort of friendly with the drummer, or well, one, one of the drummers, this bloke, Barry Barlow, used to be in tour. And he's a mate of ours, and he was telling me that they did some touring with Beefheart, and they were all big mates, you know. They'd all come from the blues, didn't it, you know? But they were perverting it, and distorting it, and making it their own thing. In terms of the book, this is very much your story. We'll get to the Bunny Men in a bit. We, the Bunny Men actually feature towards the end of this book. Uh, before that, the reader learns a lot about you, and it's about time, really, because as sometimes happens, the, the, the if I can say, the, the dominant personality in a particular group becomes the focus. Yeah, totally. That's, you know, I do interviews, and they wouldn't ask me any questions, <laughs> you know, they just, I just end up sitting there like a lemon. What brought you to, to write this? Because I understand you were, first of all, you were writing some sleeve notes, and it sort of, it spiraled from there. Certain little labels and stuff wanted a license, the early Bunny Men records, and put them out uh, on vinyl, you know, the big vinyl sort of resurgence. They asked whether I'd do liner notes, and I did it, you know, and uh, I really enjoyed doing it, and it was, it was nice to look back and think about what we actually did, and realise how important it was. When you're doing it, you don't notice. You don't sort of notice, and it's only like later on when you look back, because I never played the records. You've heard them so many times in the studio, I never want to hear it again. So it's been like 30 odd years since I've played any of them records, you know. I was chuffed really, because they sounded great. <laughs> you know, they really did sound good. And as I say, we'll, we'll get to the Bunny Men uh, eventually, but uh, there is a lot about you and your home life and you're you're growing up uh, you're growing up as well in in melling station road melling uh just tell us a bit about where that was and uh um, or what it was like as well it's about eight miles from liverpool it's kind of where to me it's well the way i've always thought about it it's where the countryside starts and the city ends so melling is like the first village after liverpool basically it ends at aintree where aintree racecourse is and then you've got the canal and then you've got farms and we've lived in the place where the farms were, you know. Uh, so I've always been like a bit of a country person rather than a town person. It was just skinheads, <laughs> you know, fights, getting chased by skinheads all the time. Uh, they, you know, we were called woolly backs and all that stuff. It's just no big deal, I'm not bothered about that. But it was, it was quite a violent time in the 60s and the 70s, you know. You do talk a lot about the the malevolent presence of your dad and how how that cast a, a shadow over everything and cast a shadow over i presume your memories of that time as well it's only like later on when you become a parent and you realize wait a minute this was a bit weird you know um there was no not much affection or love or anything like that but at the time you it's just what you just got on with it you didn't think about it i didn't think oh god my dad is not very loving or um anything like that you know it was just that's what you used to so that's what you you know didn't have to really didn't think about it really at the time it's only later on when you think that was a bit odd really your mother leaves as well your your, your sister and your brother move away as soon as they can as far as i can tell and when your mum when she finally leaves and moves away from the area you tell her and you're still very young at this point that you, you won't come and see her and and you mean that and you're true to your word and I just wonder how it is revisiting that that particular moment. Well, it wasn't like a, a big, you know, conscious cob on kind of thing where I was like, I'm not going to come and see you. And I was just said, oh, I'm not going to come and see you. And that was, that was, it was not like, I wasn't trying to hurt her or anything like that, I don't think. I think it was just like, I can't be bothered coming to see it. Do you know what I mean? It was more like that. Yeah, so it was not, it was kind of... It wasn't as cold as it sort of comes across in a way. Music features throughout this, not surprisingly. I, 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 I think it's, there's not a, a, doesn't seem to be a great moment where an inspirational music teacher uh, says, ah, oh, this boy's got talent. I am quite taken, by the way, with Lee P. Lee, who's one of your teachers, and he gives you sort of encouragement, doesn't, doesn't he? What was, it, what was the tune he played to, to try and bring order to the classroom? Beverly Hillbillies. 
sitcom, listen to a story about a man named Jed, poor mountaineer, and we're all like stomping away in the classroom, like you know, throwing things at each other and all that. And it was, it was, I, it really did remind me of the, you know, the Frankenstein films where, he, where he finds that blind man in the woods. I don't know whether you've seen it, and it's like he tames him by playing the violin. It was like that. You were lucky in that. You were born in 58, so you are in a great position, I think, because at that age, and I, I speak of somebody born in 67, so I'm not in such a great position. That was all right. Uh, you go and see... You go and see The Quo with Slade, and Slade do Get Down, Get With It. You go and see Dr. Feelgood early on as well. And this is just pure enjoyment on your part. I don't think you're looking at Wilco thinking about picking up a guitar, are you? Not really, not, not at that stage, but um, it was possibly the most exciting gig I've ever been to, the, you know, Dr. Feelgood. I saw them three times, and they were, like, electric. And the records never really got it. You know, they were too clean, you know too nicely produced even though they were, the first one was mono everybody was waiting for Wilco to kick off it was just waiting and waiting for it like you know building up the tension and then when he kicked off it was amazing amazing it's fantastic like a demented ostrich talking about um perhaps uh, 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 well a band who, who uh, to put it mildly put a different sort of sound to record uh, we're going to play a Velvet Underground number and it, the, the it's the early 70s when you buy the Velvet Underground and Nico that you bought you buy the compilation don't you so you got to get the best of both worlds on there well, yeah, it's mad because you know the Velvets had only just packed in a couple of years before but to me unlike when you're that age three years four years can seem like a lifetime ago and I thought I'd discovered this thing that was like from you know ancient times you know it was only like 67 wasn't it the first album I think so um, <laughs> it's just weird the way time stretches and it's malleable it's odd uh, let's hear Venus in Furs uh, Velvet Underground Venus in Furs as uh, featured in Will Sargent's book Bunny Man which he's discussing here on Six Music um, uh, we, we also have chapter headings in the book as well as uh, records that go with each chapter uh, such as Venus in Flares for the one which includes the Velvet Underground. Now, I, just coincidentally, I played Half Man, Half Biscuits Reflections in a flat last week, which has the line which ends Echo and the Bunny Men. It's quite an honour, isn't it? I know plenty has happened to the Bunny Men, to, but to, to be immortalised in song by Half Man, Half Biscuit must be up there, mustn't it? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like the legends around here. The drone from John Cale on that number, on Venus in Furs, uh, that and uh, you mentioned Mahavishnu Orchestra as well. You seem to have a like for that, the, the drone and the strange, that was what some may see as weird. You seem to have that going through you early on. Yeah, I don't know why. I think, um, like, I liked the Beatles when they went all, you know, with all the Indian influence stuff, you know, and George Harrison. And, uh, but I wasn't a massive Beatles fan. Like, they, I was more of a Who fan than the Beatles. I, I liked... Um, you know, I can see for miles, and I like that other one, Armenia, City in the Sky. Um, so that, that's kind of got like that trippy, Beatlesy, Indian droney. I don't know what you'd call it. There's probably a special name for it. You know, some sort of sk fancy scale or something. I don't know. Um, it just draws me. I don't know why. I like the weird stuff. I want to talk about the residents as well because. Um You've got a, you've got you very much into the residents, and we'll talk about you getting them played at Eric's in a bit. But you've got a signed residents LP. Does that mean have you met a a a resident? Uh, possibly, possibly might met a few of them. Um, I've been to their studio in in San Francisco uh, years ago. We just knocked on the door. It was me and Jake, our keyboard player, and um, we it was four 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 Grove Street in San Francisco and it was their sort of uh, you know headquarters and we just knocked on the door and said we're from England we're residence fans and they brought us in and showed us all around and it was great they had like a whole cottage industry kind of deal going on they had a bit where they were making the videos and they had a bit where it was all like storage of the records and then they had like a studio that we went into with all tape, re tape recorders and stuff and they had this little office bit um, and there was an eyeball head there and there was nobody around I put the eyeball head on and Jake took a quick picture with my Instamatic <laughs> that was it so I was you know I was in the residence even though they didn't know I was in the residence 
there's a bit in the book where you get duck stab and you, you play it on the from the, the DJ booth gets it played at, at Eric's and that's what uh, I, I wanted to, is it easy to sum up what made Eric's such a special place it wasn't always about the bands that were on it was the people that used to go there you know and that, uh, there'll be scenes going on now where people are thinking exactly the same you know or the rave scene was probably like that you know where people had their own little space at just the right time the right right age the right time and the right scene going on like punk rock was amazing it just felt like anything was possible but it was it was over pretty quick I think you know once you know when we're going down the King's Road in London and there's like punk rockers with massive Mohicans and everything immaculate and dyed and standing up straight and like the Americans taking photos of them and it's just like well, that's not punk rock you know they remain but they, they looked the part but they were uh, I don't know it just seemed a bit crap it seemed a bit fake Julian Cope who you say and he features uh, a lot as you did imagine in the story you say he just about managed to transcend being annoying with his enthusiasm which is a lo lovely way of putting it um <laughs> uh, but also the first time seeing McCulloch is in there and talking of uh, the you know, DIY fashions um, he's wearing flared cords held in by elastic bands and, and jellies on his feet as well so you know he's, he's, he's getting it right you just had to mix and match and do whatever you could you know nobody had any money you know we weren't all down Vivian Westwood's shop no chance so you had to make your own thing I made an x-ray specs t-shirt by ten and a t-shirt inside out and I had, my dad had some stencils from the wood yard where he used to work and I stenciled on the front x-ray specs and it went all the way right round and so the x became at the front again and I splashed it with paint and all that sort of crap and you know you just had to do what you could and find things in second hand shops if it gave you a creative outlet like look at Pete Burns you know he's he was the ultimate you know, he made loads of stuff for himself and, like, um, he stood out, you know, really. You know, a bit inventive. And that was what was going on with you, wasn't it? When, 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 uh, well, when various people came to sort of try and make music at your place, you, you had, you, you were putting together various bits of equipment there. You had reel to reel there. You eventually got the Mini Pops drum machine as well. So there's, you were sort of into that side of it. Uh, experimenting right from the start weren't you yeah well I like tape recorders and that stemmed from going around to my friend over the road Dave Mazenko's and they used to record Top of the Pops on a Grundig tape recorder or you know or the chart run down on a Sunday night you know um, and we always used to record it and it just seemed like a magical thing a tape recorder and then when I saw Roxy Music with Brian Eno and he had a tape recorder he had a Revox at the back and he used to you know mess around with that and feed in you know odd sound effects and things like this it was just like wow uh, you know you can be in a band and just mess around with a tape recorder i'm doing that you've been figuring stuff out with with uh, with ian mcculloch and, and with and with les patterson by by this stage when you when you did the first gig but as, uh, it wasn't until you did that gig that you realized what what ian was bringing in terms of the actual songs and the lyrics for them as well it's all it was a proper learning experience that first gig very successful one as it turned out but until he started singing you didn't know what to expect yourself let alone anybody else no but none of us had heard him sing i think he'd done a couple of rehearsals with um, a shallow madness or whatever they were called but i don't think he was that bothered and uh so when we first heard him singing it was like bloody hell this is great you know it's just a, it brought it all together nicely you know like we we've been messing around with guitars for months, me and him. And coming up with like riffs and guitar chord sequences and stuff like that. And but we'd never heard him sing and I never even thought to say, like, can you sing? <laughs> you know what I mean? Or anything like that. You know, it just so happened that he could. <laughs> and really brilliantly as well. So um it was a, a great it was a great moment really. Cause we, we just did the one riff for like 12 minutes and it was unusual because the drum machine and everything and it was just repetitive it was quite kraut rocky really you know quite sort of can kind of vibe to it early in your encounter with Ian McCulloch he sort of quotes 
from uh, this song and uh, it's another one you've chosen for tonight this is David Bowie Sound and Vision that's David Bowie Sound and Vision Will Sargent is my guest here on Six Music talking about his book Bunny Man uh, we should uh, the, the naming of the band the honours there goes to very much to Julian Cope because when he when it comes to introducing you for the first time on stage there were a number of possibilities and he he went for the right one it seems yeah well in retrospect yeah i hated it at the time but it, 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 he never thought of the name it was some lad called paul Alabeck who had a flat and mac you know mac lit uh, stayed at his flat and uh he had these this list of names i hadn't seen the list no one had told me about any list and i hadn't even thought about a name yeah no. um and there was, he just had this bit of paper. Julian got this list of, um, you know, possible names, and they were all kind of like stupid names, like a student would come up with, you know, glycerol and the fan extractors, uh, Mona Lisa and the grease guns. He was trying to be like, you know, surreal. And Echo and the Bunnymen was one of them, and that's the one Julian read off the list, and that was it. And I hated it. I thought, what the, what the hell is that? That's awful. And. Um, but, you know, obviously, I, I quite like the bunny men side of it, you know. I like the word bunny men. Um, but, you know, you, a name becomes irrelevant, like, look at Oasis. You know, it's it's a terrible name. It sounds like a tannin salon in Gleethorpes. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's not, it's not exactly thrilling, yeah. But there they are, they're one of the biggest bands in the world, or where the part of the book after the first gig that first gig goes very well and then there's another one that doesn't go so well which is like the traditional way it happens and then in the year or so after that 18 months maybe as long as that things appear to be in this quite mad fast forward um does, did it seem like that at the time is that how it seemed you become like uh as though you expect it and that's where the arrogance kind of starts coming in we didn't have to do much before people were paying attention I think a lot of it was to do with Mac and the way he looked and everything like we all looked pretty good you know Les looked amazing Les looked like look, Mac's mum used to say he looked like a Greek god and he, he did <laughs> you know Pete had a six pack well it's just later on isn't it but you know Pete had a six pack before they were invented that's going to be in the next book as you mentioned right towards the end of the book Pete DeFratis arrives the lineup is complete and the, the final paragraph points the way to what I presume will be part two, part two of Bunnyman. Are you working on that now? I've got a few ideas written down, but I haven't actually started it properly yet, but I will be. And um, I'm hoping to do, like, maybe three books, possibly four, I don't know, keep going, see how it goes. Mm. I, I enjoy doing it. It's like going in a time machine and using your brain to travel back in time. It's great, and you, the way you can remember exactly like the smell of the carpet in Eric's or you know um, what the kitchen was like in 15 Station Road well more power to you and thanks for and, and this works out great I think this this book is I look forward to the next volume and if you want to do another one after that uh, that as well um, we're going to play Marky Moon now uh, what do you want to say about Marky Moon it's just perfect it's like Ravel's Bolero or something to me you know it just keeps building and building that's just one of the best records ever. Well, here it is, then. This is Marky e. Moon. Thanks a million for joining us, Will. Nice one. <laughs> 